So this whole complex is going to burn. Burn. And there's a good reason we're burning this. Here I am setting up a whole bunch of GoPros to try to get ready for igniting 350,000 laser cut pieces of cardboard and film it in slow motion to help us understand these Western fires. So when the lights go out, don't move. Gasoline. The reason they're doing this is that it is extremely important to understand fire, maybe now more than ever. So let me back up to why we're doing this. We can't just put the fires out because we can't put them out. We've tried that now for a century and it doesn't work. It just makes the next one worse. You may see a place like this and think total devastation. And it's not your fault for thinking that. It's probably how it was portrayed in the media. Destroying entire town. They are beyond our control. The worst in the world. The amount of destruction is staggering. Is climate change has turned devastating wildfires into an annual event in California. But that depiction is, as we've learned from countless experts over the last two weeks, not the whole story and not how you should think about wildfires. The truth is, there are a lot of habitats out west, and fire affects them each in unique ways. So it's important to start understanding the big picture when you start thinking about wildland fires. But first, to the very beginning. To help us understand what is happening out west with these massive, destructive fires, Haley and I started calling the experts. And what we learned is that the story of fire out west is complex. So to help us understand all of this, we planned a road trip. Road trip time. The goal of our road trip was to see as many forests as we could and meet experts around the region to help us understand the role fire plays out here. First destination was to find the forest burned by the now famous Great Fires of 1910. And at the heart of what is known as the Big Blow Up, the logical first place to stop, the city of Wallace. Hi there. Hi. Good. Haley and I are in this cute town of Wallace, Idaho, which was completely destroyed by the 1910 fires. You can see how much damage this fire actually did. Let's send up the drone and see what the surroundings look like now. What we found was a small town surrounded by a dense forest with every single tree just over 100 years old. So everything we see behind us now, that's all new growth since 1910. And to help us put these historic fires and the forests around Wallace in perspective, we met up with historian Diane Smith. This is Wallace, and here are your fires. All of this is the 1910 fires. This is not that unusual. The fact is it just was at a time in our development as a country. Uh, we noticed it, we paid attention to it, and we got the national attention for right. it. Right. As it turns out, these fires helped reinforce the idea at the time that every fire needed to be suppressed at all costs. And this suppression for so long has led to new problems, namely thick forests full of fuel. But don't just take my word for it. Let me show you the difference. Notice how different this place is than this one that has been thinned out quite heavily in the past, or like an area like this that's been burnt quite frequently. In fact, both of these areas show how many forests would have looked in the past under regular burns. The dead and low-growing material gets consumed easily by fire, very much unlike this forest, which has had fire suppression for over a hundred years and could lead to a high-intensity fire. And all of this dry, dead material, that's problematic because this stuff here is what can lead to a catastrophic fire. So we went looking for a big fire and just followed the smoke. Oh gosh, a huge crown fire. I gotta get this. And nobody knows that better than the people that work in this particular forest. There's green coming back and I guess I've gotten somewhat used to it and I still have hope that the entire Sierra Nevadas won't look like this, that we can maybe get ahead of it. So the fires nowadays can move from the surface right into the tree canopies really easily, where in the past, fires would have 
kept trees pruned, they would have kept fuel densities low. And so now you end up with a lot more high severity fires in the West than had a fire regime kept under its historic recurrence. This to me is more a lesson of fire exclusion and keeping fire out of the system. If we're keeping it out of when it would burn with a beneficial effect, it will burn and the probability of it burning at an unbeneficial state is higher. So again, this is where it's complicated. We thought if only we could stop the fires, we'd win the fight. But the fires like the King Fire here show that stopping the fires only made it worse. Add that to the fact that we're living closer than ever to these wild lands. So to help us understand the wildland urban interface, we met up with Cal Fire. And as we were pulling up to this neighborhood, one of the residents quickly came out to tell us about the latest fire. Yeah, Our biggest fear is fire. It was very scary. I mean, everybody was honking and get out and, you know, there's a fire. This is the risk across California. The response piece alone isn't going to solve this challenge if the homeowners aren't if, organized. Because yeah. we're all in the same boat. One match away from everybody <laughs> losing everything this is a real fear. Literally, we could have that fire spread up in here within a matter of seconds. Wow. California is going to have fires. We're not going to stop all the fires in California. So we have to have an infrastructure that's fire resistant. We need to work on policies that help us engage in active management of our forest. That's using prescribed fire as a tool. It's all the things in the toolbox. It's a combination of managing our forests and a combination of protecting our communities that are in them. If it wasn't complicated enough, this made it very clear that you can't just let the fires burn whenever they start. The forests need to be managed to help mitigate the risk to us. But using fire seems to be one of the keys to making things safer, and knowing the science behind fire is always key to implementing good management. Fire Sciences Lab, right over here. So we made a stop at the Missoula Fire Lab to try to understand what we know about fire. What? You see the flames at the very top and how they're sticking to the slope? They really are. Everybody's laying down. They're laying the down. Well, that's, that's flame attachment. Actually a very difficult thing to understand. Here at the fire lab, the scientists study the basics of fire. Understanding the complexities here helps firefighters and forest managers in the field better predict and fight wildland fires. Fires are inevitable. The only choices that we really have is what kind of fire to have and when do we want it? And that's it. Almost? Ready. You're ready. Jason's ready. Mark's team is prepping to light a huge bed of precisely cut cardboard. You're not going to be in any danger. So when the lights go out, um, don't move. Gasoline. This is one of many experiments they'll run to understand the physics of fire, how it moves, how it spreads, and all of this measured by precise scientific instruments and high-speed cameras. Tens of thousands of pieces of cardboard up in flames in mere seconds. The ongoing research will help us better understand fire with the ultimate goal that we can live better with it. But can we do that? And there is one forest we knew of that seems to have figured out this coexistence with fire, a place where fires burn all summer, every summer. It's part of their way of life and a mentality we wanted to know about. And here we went out with our guides, Frank Lake and Steve Valentine, who work with the local U.S. Forest Service and tribe to help keep a healthy forest. This is perfect. The fires basically come through and cleared out the understory and all that's left are the trees. Yeah, it's black and it's charred and you just see a few of the earliest sprouts, but you come back in here a year, it's gonna be alive again. And to many, this may seem destroyed, but they view it differently here. That fire's medicine because it's not, if it comes, it's when it comes, we need fire and fire needs us. Frank and Steve's ancestors have been burning this forest for millennia. It's now part of what makes the forest special. They just want to make sure that it's not forgotten. Basically what you leave behind is what's important. When they say this is your foods and your medicines, your sacred places, your springs, your water, that's essential. That's who we are as people. We have to learn to live with fire. We have to learn to respect fire. We have to maintain that security. That's why I do what I do. Haley and I have learned a lot on our journey. We learned that fire is complicated. 
It's not as black and white as we make it out to be, but it is an integral part of our forest. They've had fire running through them for thousands of years and they will continue to have fire in them in the future. And we can't put the fires out. We have to decide what kind of fires we want to live with. And that is why we need to work with these fire crews from all the agencies around the country. We also need a public who's ready to learn to live with fire. A healthy forest, you see, is a forest that lives with fire. So I hope the take home for you is that understanding fires out west is actually really complicated. It's not just about climate change. Now, we talked very little about climate change here. It's not making things any better, but there is a lot we can do on the ground right now to make sure that we can live better with fire. Thanks for watching. If you want to see more, click on some of these videos.